here I will show you actually that uh, the naive approach to measures and uh, the extension of Riemann integration explained in the previous video is not really working out of the box the way we introduce it. I mean, of course, if we the problem with that is actually beyond those three examples I gave to you, beyond those three examples of measures I gave to you in the previous video, there isn't much can be done in the in the in this case. I mean. Uh, the way the measures were introduced, the way they were defined in the previous video, uh, you cannot find the examples of the of such measures beyond those three examples. I I mean, you obviously can do some modifications to those, but as soon as you come to some really fundamental examples of measures like length or area, length on the line or area on the plane, the way the measures were introduced in the previous video, which is called measures naive approach, you can't find a suitable suitable measure which will play the role of the length of the area. This is actually what is called the Vitalis theorem, and it says this. Uh, there is no non-trivial, meaning non-zero, additive functions on R, real line, such that it is, it matches, it satisfies this property. Uh, in a simple language, it means that there is no additive function on R the way it was introduced before, if uh, such that it also translation invariant, something regular length truly possess. So this set A plus X, so A here is a subset of R, X is a number, and A plus X is the set obtained by the shift of the set A by the by the X unit by X unit to the right. So Vitalis theorem in fact says that as soon as you put extra condition of your measure, so you have an additive function, but as soon as you require this function to be translation invariant, so if you translate the length or the measure of the set doesn't change, you can you can't find the example of, of such functions anymore. So, although measures were useful to define the integrals, you can't, with this concept of a measure, in fact, you can't produce something which will resemble, truly resemble Riemann integration. Let's just see why this is so. Uh, so, I have a proof here for you. It's a very nice proof. So, first, I have to give you some in, uh, preliminary info on what is called the equivalence relations. So, if I have two points, 0, 1, you have 2.01, uh, I will call them equivalent, and I will write x tilde y, even only if the difference of these two numbers, so 0, 1, is rational number. This is a what is called the equivalence relation, uh, meaning that if I introduce now a set x bar, which is a set of all points from 0, 1, equivalent to the given point x. This is a set. This set, they will have some particular properties. And I will, I will say these properties here. Uh, yeah. This set will have the following number of properties. Actually, I'll say, them, I'll say them here. I'll just move it a little bit to the right. Like this. Yeah. I'll say it like this, if x is equivalent to y, uh, then, then then corresponding class for x coincides with corresponding class for y. Let me just move it like this. If x is not equivalent to y, then the corresponding class for x doesn't intersect the corresponding class for y. And also, on the top of these two properties, now I can 
will look like this. Uh, the whole set 0, 1 is split into the union of such equivalence classes. So, so it's split into the union of S from S, where the Polygraphic S is the collection of all such equivalence classes of all such equivalence classes. So somehow when you have the equivalence relation on a set, your set splits into these sort of slices, each of them being the equivalence class. And the equivalence class they are either identical or do not overlap at all. There is only partial overlapping between the equivalence classes. This result is called the fundamental theorem of equivalence relations. And there's a good presentation for this with the proof, I think, on the Wikipedia, so I'll just leave it for you as an independent task, uh, as a task for independent study. Now, if I have such a thing, if I have such a splitting of 0, 1 intervals into the classes of equivalences with this particular choice of the equivalences, now I can construct what's called the Vitali set, and that's the main idea of the Vitali's proof. Set the, let me just define a set V like this. It will be a set of numbers chosen one from each equivalence class which means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of the set V and the corresponding class X sub X here of course I just use this another notation for the equivalence class associated associated with associated with number x, s sub x, with identical notations. All right, so now the proof of the theorem that there is no such an additive set function, which is also translation invariant, which is based on the following observation, the one which I call lemma. It says this, the Vitali set, this one constructed here, does not intersect with the shifted or translated Vitali set as long as the, you're looking at the non-trivial translation where R is the uh, yeah as long as you look at the non-trivial and I, I think I have to add here rational non-trivial rational translation just look at the proof of this smaller lemma uh, it's not like this let's just assume the opposite that there is an element in this intersection uh, and uh, now there is an element in this intersection which means that on one hand x belongs to the Vitali set and on the other hand x also belongs to this one so x is in fact shifted element of the Vitali set so this one just from here and this one from the second along now, if I have this, I can now say that x is equivalent to y, right? Because the difference of x and y is the r, which is a rational number. That's the definition of my equivalence. Which means that the corresponding classes coincide. Look at this. If the numbers are equivalent, the classes are coincide. But because the Vitali set is chosen in a special way, it's just one-to-one -one correspondence between the sets and numbers. Actually, it means that actually x and y coincide or means that r is zero, and that's a contradiction. Contradiction with the assumption that r was not zero. So we see that actually, in fact, that if you translate the Vitali set with a non-trivial rational shift, it will be completely disjoint set from the original Vitali set. Now, we can finish the proof now of the Vitali theorem like this. Look at this. Uh, I make the following observation for you. And actually, if you now take all possible rational sh translations of your Vitali set, okay, that's the because again, remember Q is the countable set, so it's like a countable union. Then on one hand, it will have all elements of zero one. On the other hand, it will be a subset of the slightly bigger set, negative 1, 2. Why this is so? Well, because I think it's quite obvious. Now, if I have these two, 
if I have these two embeddings, then I will use one, one extra thing about measures, which I haven't discussed in details, but we will discuss this with you actually quite extensively. It says like this, if I have two subsets, one is smaller than the other, then the measure of the smaller one is numerically smaller than the measure of the other one. That's the like a, one of the basic properties of measures, so we will discuss this soon at length. But right now I can use this, because now I can see that the measure of this set is less than the measure of this set, and less than the measure of this set. So that's what's set here. Measure of 0, 1, less or equal than the measure of... And remember, these are all disjoint sets, it's the lemma. That's lemma. And so the measure of the disjoint union is the sum of the individual measures. And each of these individual measures, remember this, because the measure is assumed to be translation invariant, it's just M of V. E. And you have something like this. Now, from left side, from the left inequality, you would conclude that the measure of V is non-trivial. Because if it was trivial, then the whole sum will be zero, and then this will be zero. But we remember, we start with the non-trivial measure. But on the other hand, if each of these numbers, and actually it's one single number, is non-negative, and you have infinitely many of such, the sum will be infinite. And that's then mean, which means that this one is not true. You can't control an infinite, no, infinite infinity with a finite positive number. This is a finite positive number. That leads to a contradiction. And that's the reason why Vitali theorem is true. That's the reason why Vitali theorem is true. You don't have a non-trivial additive function with the extra property that it is translation invariant. That's why the naive approach to measures and Riemann integration to the extension of Riemann integration is not working. And that's why we have to make like a further adjustments and construct more complex and sophisticated theory.